President, officer, this government has no grip of the NHS crisis. Uh, staff are being asked to do the impossible, and patients are being asked to accept the unacceptable. Here's just one example. 81-year-old Katrina McFarlane has bone cancer, a disease that can cause significant pain and increases the risk of fractures. Last month, she had a fall at home, and she and her husband heard a snapping sound. She was in extreme pain. Because of her condition, she was told she would need to be transported to hospital in an ambulance. That was at 10.15 in the morning. At 11 o'clock that night, 13 hours later, Katrina was still waiting in pain. The emergency operator, who was in tears, said that they could not even guarantee an ambulance by the next morning. The following day, Katrina's husband gave up on waiting for an ambulance and, in desperation, took her to hospital himself. She was diagnosed with a fractured pelvis. First Minister, why did Katrina McFarlane have to wait in pain for nearly 24 hours for an ambulance that never turned up? First Minister. Well, obviously, I'm happy to look into Katrina's experience. Uh, nobody should wait that length of time for an ambulance, and um, I will not say uh, otherwise. Uh, however, this government continues, uh, as we do with Accident Emergency and the NHS overall, uh, we continue to focus on supporting our NHS through these difficult times so that it can recover from the impact of the pandemic uh, and get back to delivering the level of service uh, that all patients have a right to expect, looking uh, specifically at the ambulance service, which again, like a &E, it is dealing with significant pressures. Uh, but staffing under this government up by 67.3 per cent, uh, the number of paramedics up by almost 40 per cent, ambulance technicians up by more than 60 per cent. In this year, we have allocated additional funding, £45 million over the ambulance services baseline funding to support workforce growth and service improvement. Our ambulances uh, are saving more critically unwell patients than ever before. They're diverting cases away from accident and emergency. And while, of course, an experience like that is not acceptable, and there will be other patients having experiences like that right now, uh, the fact is that the vast majority of people uh, who rely on our ambulance service or any part of the NHS uh, get an extraordinarily good uh, service from those who work in our National Health Service. The duty of me uh, and my government is to ensure through investment uh, and other interventions that we are supporting them every step of the way. It's not easy. It's not easy for any government right now, particularly in light of the economic circumstances, uh, but we will not shy away from that duty each and every single day. Anna Sarwar. Week after week, year after year, the First Minister comes and tells people it's unacceptable and then expects people to accept the unacceptable with devastating consequences across the country. Change the script, First Minister. Because Katrina's experience is not an isolated one. One of the reasons ambulances aren't available is because they are queuing outside A&E waiting to drop off patients, in some cases for hours. Last week, I highlighted the hidden waits at assessment units. This week, patients waiting hours in ambulances just to get through the doors of a hospital. In the past month, over 2,700 ambulances across Scotland waited at least an hour and 50 minutes to drop off their patients. At just one hospital in one month, the Queen Elizabeth in Glasgow, 218 ambulances waited over three hours. These are ambulances and paramedics that should be out on the road supporting patients, but instead forced to wait hours outside A&E. Last year, I asked this government to support calls from paramedics and ambulance drivers for there to be a 15-minute turnaround time at A&E with a maximum wait of 30 minutes. Why isn't this government listening to the paramedics and listening to the ambulance drivers? Why are things getting worse and even before we've reached the peak winter challenges? First Minister. Well, firstly, I, I won't uh, stop what this government is doing to support our National Health Service because government uh, at the best of times, and these are not the best of times, is hard. It is more complicated. Uh, than simple sound bites or, or setting uh, the targets. We have to do the work in order to achieve that. Uh, and that means supporting our National Health Service, those who work in it, uh, with the investment and the wider support 
that uh, they need. And we will continue to take all of these steps. I've narrated the increase in the numbers working in our ambulance service, the additional investment uh, that we are putting into the ambulance service to ensure that we can see that improvement. Where Anna Sauer is right is that these issues are all interconnected. So we need to invest in the wider health service in order to improve performance of the ambulance service. So no, I won't uh, stop saying uh, that we are doing these things because these are the necessary steps that any government needs to take to support our NHS in these, these tough times. Of course, management of the NHS is our responsibility, nobody else's, but our NHS is not immune from wider economic and budgetary decisions that unfortunately are out with uh, the hands of this government. I wish we could invest much, much more in our National Health Service. Uh, and I agree very much with uh, the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford, where he recognises that while it's his responsibility to manage the health service in Wales, that has been impacted by the decisions of the Tories at Westminster. He can recognise that. Uh, I just am left wondering why Anna Sarwar, uh, instead of uh, making sure that people understand the impact of Tory decisions, uh, wants to pretend that that doesn't exist. Anna Sarwar. Uh, I'll never shy away from attacking the Tories for their decisions, but this government must need to recognise their responsibility for the decisions they make and the impact it has. Always somebody else to blame, always somebody else's fault, the same old soundbite and the same old script from this tired First Minister. But she doesn't want to listen to me, so maybe she should listen to the words of an ambulance driver. Waiting times at the Queen Elizabeth and everywhere else, and elsewhere, sorry, are not a post-pandemic issue. We have been raising this for as long as I've been in the service, but sadly, the times are getting longer, patients are getting sicker, and it's happening in all seasons now, not only in the winter months. It's got so bad that ambulance workers have voted this week for strike action, not just because of pay, but because they feel undervalued and under-resourced for years. But this government are in denial. Growing queues at A&Es for treatment, ambulances off the road for hours trying to drop off patients, and people waiting in pain for help to come. All of this before we have even reached the worst of winter. Lives are being lost as a result. And now the Health Secretary says it's going to take another five years to fix the problem. A problem 15 years in the making. After 15 years of SNP government, why should patients in Scotland have to wait a minute longer? First Minister. Uh, I, I will always uh, listen to those who work in our NHS and listen very carefully because they are the experts uh, on the situation. Um, but I will not insult their intelligence uh, by pretending that these issues are easy to resolve. We will continue to support those in the front line of our National Health Service with record investments, supporting record recruitment into our National Health Service and supporting the redesign of our NHS to make sure that patients get the treatment they need when and where they need it, because that is in the interest of those who work in our National Health Service as well. Um, and of course, we will continue to do everything we possibly can uh, to reward those who work in the NHS to the fullest possible extent. That is why the pay offer that has been made to Agenda for Change staff is in Scotland an average 7 per cent compared to 4.5 uh, per cent in England and indeed uh, in Wales where Labour is in government. Uh, so we take these responsibilities extremely seriously every single day, every minute of every single day. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, the pressures on our National Health Service uh, are not divorced uh, from wider budgetary issues. Uh, you know, the uh, Welsh Labour Health Minister said uh, recently, she said this, that the NHS in Wales next year would be, and I'm quoting her, hell on earth without additional funding from the UK government. Yeah. Uh, she said that the Welsh government faces a real nightmare in running the NHS next year unless the UK government steps up with additional funding. How come it is the case that Labour in Wales can recognise that reality, but Labour in Scotland is clearly so filled uh, to defending Tories that they are blind to that reality. So we will continue to do everything we can in terms of the management of our National Health Service. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we do need more funding for our National Health Service, and that can only come from decisions that are taken at Westminster. We'll move to general